there is Coach Jen Winkler. Go check her out Hi. on Instagram. She is Coach Jen Winkler. Not hard to find. J E N W I N K L E R. She's a keto and carnivore family uh, coach and and of interest. But she wrote to me because she was one of the people that I said, "Hey, you want to come on my show? I'd love to interview people that maybe I don't normally interview." And she's like, I want to talk about my epilepsy journey because it's been frustrating going through the mainstream medicine system and how they treat you as a patient. And then you had to learn on your own about ketogenic diets and then you weren't really supported with that. So we're going to talk all about that here on today's show. So Jen, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. It's a privilege. Yes, yes. So tell us a little bit about uh, the epilepsy. So was this something that started when you were a young girl? When when did you get epilepsy? Yeah, so I was 12 years old. I was in fifth grade um, was my first seizure. And so it's probably like around puberty time kind of thing, which does have a, it's not just a random thing to say, but it, it has a piece of the puzzle. So we were in computer class, those old, um, I don't know if you remember those old green screen computers. And those kinds, so they were pretty flashy, like little strobe type of thing. So I I uh, had a seizure there, but by the time I got to the ER and the details got there, they weren't sure, you know, maybe it was a seizure, maybe not. So then my second one happened, I think it was about a month after uh, at a friend's house, we had a sleepover, which we didn't sleep like kids do. And when I got home, um, trying to tell my mom about it, that's where I had my another seizure there because I was sleep deprived. So my primary uh, triggers were sleep deprivation and uh, photosensitivity. So that's where I started, got the diagnosis there, did the EEG, MRI, and they said, yes, you have. So Jen, do you know why the flashing light, I've heard that my whole life that it could trigger seizures. What is it about the flashing light that does that? You know, I don't know the science of it, but I know it's not many people with epilepsy that, um, that have that trigger. It's it's somewhere between 10 and 20% of diagnoses right. have sensitivity. Yeah. But those warnings everywhere in like a fun house that has a strobe light. Yeah. Warning can induce seizures. And it's like, how? Like, I would love mechanistically to understand. You know, I, I, I would like to research that and figure that part out. Um, because right as of right now, like I, the only time those kind of things bothered me was during the EEG and that computer. Following that time, uh, I never had a seizure due to flashing lights or one of the ones they warn you about when you're 16 with epilepsy getting your license is the lights shining through the trees yeah. is another photosensitivity, but it never bothered me. I even went on roller coasters and stuff, but um, yeah, those, it wasn't until it was, that was one of the main ones. And when they do the EEG, they do uh, flashing lights really fast. Yeah different colors so yeah yeah Kariana says it's the visual cortex and that would be the same thing with the lights coming through the sunlight coming mm -hmm. through the trees it's just kind of this I, I remember even like as a kid I didn't have epilepsy or anything but I remember seeing those lights and just kind of going whoa that's just that's rough on the eyes yeah yeah I think it would affect a lot of people <laughs> in in one way or another so tell us, okay, so uh, you got this 12 years old 16 you're still kind of dealing with it w when did it become this thing where you went to see doctors tr really trying to get to the bottom of it and get it under control. Because as the years went by, you were probably like, look, something's got to give. Uh, drugs aren't working. Therapies aren't working. Something's got to give. Yes. Good question. So um, I was on Depakote back then and it controlled it. I almost felt like I didn't even have seizures except for the insulin resistance that I then gained from that medication. Yeah. Um, so I gained a lot of weight. I got into college, which it was very difficult with epilepsy and the medication. And I got up to about 200 pounds. Um, so at that point, that's when I had pancreatitis and, and all these side effects started happening from the medication. So they switched me. I got a ton of seizures on the new medication. And it was then in college that I started I think I saw it on a poster or a blog. Maybe it was your blog. I don't know, because it was back in 2005, six, somewhere in there. And I had heard about ketogenic diet because I was trying to research, okay, the medication's not working for me anymore. And that's one of the things that the medical society usually says is, 
if you fail controlling the seizures two or three medications okay now we can try nutrition which i feel like is backwards but well they call, <laughs> call it dre drug resistant epilepsy but mm -hmm. like, why would you not take the path of least resistance which is diet diet is exactly. hard to change your diet now for the purposes of controlling epilepsy it's a very different diet yes. than just a ketogenic diet like like i talk about in the day-to-day the ketogenic diet, which I've, I've interviewed a lot of those experts that are doing this work at Johns Hopkins and different places. Mm -hmm. uh, John Freeman, one of the kind of leaders yeah. in that. Eric Kossoff, another one I've had on the show before. And they talk about the ketogenic diet, which is like a very high fat, very low protein, and obviously next to nil carbohydrate diet. Um, yeah. How to make it palatable for kids, especially uh, it's hard to get them to eat that much fat and make it yeah. full, but they do a good job. But that was the first exposure you had to that after years of frustration. Yeah. And I, I mean, so I had asked my neurologist, it was back in Boston. I, I used to live there and they were just like, oh no, that's for kids. Sorry. No hope. And that's it. And then, um, so I just kept going. I tried uh, new medications, um, dual therapy with two or three medications, uh, moved here to Phoenix and was at a, a very well-known hospital here that they treat epilepsy. They're just world renowned. So I went to them and then it was probably 2017 um, that I was realizing my medications just, this was the key thing that frustrated me. I wasn't having any more seizures. I should make that clear. 2005 was my last grand mal seizure, but I was still getting auras. I was getting migraines. I was getting little things. So whenever I brought that up to my new neurologist, she would say, okay, yeah, let's up the dose again. Without taking an EEG, without any of that stuff, okay, we'll just throw you another pill, another pill. And before I knew it, my liver enzymes were through the roof. Yes. And um, the medication level in the blood lab was even through the roof. And they just, it, it, like, it didn't matter. And, and, and the symptoms kept getting worse. So there was no correlation, like, maybe the medication's causing this. Right. So well, I asked her about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Here's the thing with mainstream medicine. And it, not just epilepsy. They do it with diabetes. They do it with everything. They yeah. feel like it's going to be progressively worse and worse and worse. And so, therefore, they keep giving you more and more and more of the drug, not realizing that there is a, a counterproductiveness that does kick in at some point where that drug mm -hmm. is only going to work just so well. And like in the, in the case of a type 2 diabetic, they keep giving them more metformin, more metformin, and then they put them on, you know, insulin, and they, they do all these things. That's just a band-aid to what the underlying thing is. And in your case, and in the case of diabetes, it was nutrition. Yes, it was. I finally, I had asked this neurologist, like, okay, I, I keep hearing more about this keto thing. And it was, 2017 was when it was starting to really blow up even more so. Um, and she said, well, you can try modified Atkins. Here's like, it was like a pamphlet book. And I said, but can you give someone a guide me? Cause I, like many people didn't know nutrition. I didn't know what a carb or protein, a fat and all that stuff. So I took it upon myself and your podcast was actually one of the first ones my husband and I tuned into, um, with you and Dr. Will Cole. And, um, there was, there were a few others. We were just diving in because my husband, he joined in. He's like, well, I got to do something for my health anyways. Cause he had colitis and five weeks in his colitis went into remission. And for me, I'm like, okay, I got to make sure I do this right. Because like you said, epilepsy is a whole different story, but I couldn't find anybody local. I looked up Charlie foundation. Um, and it, it just seemed too complicated for me. I knew I wouldn't stick to it, honestly, with the, the, ratios and measuring and everything so we just dove in we watched a documentary on netflix i think a lot of people have heard of the magic pill and that was our springboard that was like okay this little girl with autism and all this stuff it's it's helped them let's just try it what's the worst that can happen our health is already bad yeah. so um so that's when we just started diving in podcast books i read eric kaufman's book with uh the john hopkins to see the therapeutic side of it and um yeah, it, it's weight started shedding because I was over 200 pounds at that point. So that was what most people do it for. And uh, the side effects I was having from the medication and just lifestyle of lack of sleep, which then causes seizures. So a huge lack of sleep and insomnia, anxiety, irritability, panic attacks, a lot of mental health stuff. Yeah. Um, that started clearing up. 
And the funny part, my husband told me to mention this part. So a year into the ketogenic therapy, things are going well, but the symptoms are getting better, getting worse. It's going back and forth. So I go to the doctor and I say, uh, well, I needed to go to the doctor. No, they're booked up six months. I said, well, I'm getting these horrible anxiety attacks. They're still there. Went to the, um, her assistant. They said, okay, you can see her assistant. So she asked me all these questions. I'm on the over the max dose of Keppra and I'm on the max dose of Zonisamide. And all she has to say is, well, it sounds like you need to see a psychologist. And right on the Keppra insert, it says a lot of mental health side effects, like even suicide is a big one. So I left there crying. <laughs> like I wasn't able to drive anymore because I felt unsteady. And that's when I found, um, gosh, I just had a blank. Uh, yeah, we, we started tweaking things. And I met Christy Wheeler, who is a dietitian at Phoenix Children's Hospital. She does it for the pediatric epilepsy. So she started guiding me a bit. And I switched over to Mayo Neurologist. I met a doctor who did a study for ketogenic with adults uh, with epilepsy. Yeah. And so met with him, he did a three day EEG. There were no signs of seizures. The stuff I was feeling was not of epilepsy nature. So he's like, let's get you off those meds. And I was like, finally, a doctor that's working with me. And um, yeah, we start, started slowly titrating down. I got off of zonisamide completely. That was 500 milligrams. Kepra, I was up to 4,000 milligrams, and currently I am down to 2,500. And if I wanted to lower again, I could. Um, I'm just, I don't have side effects anymore. I'm okay. I'm taking it slow. My liver enzymes are back to normal. Everything's good. So, yeah. See, the frustrating thing as just a lay person that tries to educate other lay people is they hear all these things that mainstream medicine tells them they need to do. So go on this medication, it's going to help with X. Well, then they don't tell you X turns into another thing that you right. deal with. And you mentioned something earlier that one of the medications you took to control your seizures actually developed into insulin resistance, which then comes mm -hmm. with its own issues down the road. I see your, uh, your husband's bragging on you, your super wife. <laughs> He's like, she's my super wife. You can <laughs> wife all you want on my show, brother. <laughs> but like, that's just frustrating from my perspective because people are so trusting and you have to be, when you're in the position you are, you put your hope and your trust in these doctors that they know what is best for you and what you found going through your rigmarole journey is, no, they didn't really know what was best. They knew how to keep you kind of going along and moving along in life, but you really never felt great until you took matters into your own hands. Exactly. And actually the doctor at Mayo Clinic, which he has since moved. So now I'm kind of on another search. Um, he actually said that like, cause I was crying in his office. I could not control emotions, like all the stuff the medication was doing to me. And he said, one of the things that we take pride in here is quality of life. And, and that's an important factor is to make sure it's not just controlling the seizures, but that you're living to the best ability that you can. And, and when he said that, I was just like, finally someone, and I was just crying. So full of hope. And I was very thankful for him. Um, but it, it is hard to find, like, even one of the things I think a lot of people have that you've talked about, Judy Cho has talked about is the digestive aspect, yeah. standard diet. My body wasn't used to the fats and the proteins. Um, so I was getting horrible stomach cramps every single day. No idea what it was. I was ready to give up. And that's when Christy helped me. She's like, no, you don't need more PPIs, like the Zantac and all that stuff. You need HCL, uh, the beta in HCL to increase the stomach acid. I was like, oh, okay. You know, tried that. And since then, like even more. And, and that's what I love about this space is some people say keto doesn't work for me, whatever their goal is, medically, weight loss, whatever. But it's, it, I didn't figure it out in the first year. Like it was step by step. I was one of those people. I bought that big bag of stevia from Walmart, realizing later, oh crap, there's maltodextrin in it. <laughs> you know, and it's just the journey. It was the journey of self discovery, of figuring it out, listening to people like you. And, and I, I love Judy now and Ken Berry and all these kind of people that 
are educating us for free, essentially, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's been a great journey. Well, and that whole idea, well, keto didn't work for me. And I always go, which version? Because yes. keto isn't a diet. Keto can kind of fall on a spectrum depending on your metabolic state. If you're more insulin sensitive, you can get away with more carbohydrate and more protein mm -hmm. and not have ill effects. But if you're heavily diabetic and your A1C is 13 or 14, you're going to need a super low carb, probably yeah. moderate protein, higher fat to kind of get things going. Yeah, it's, it's amazing to me that people will give up so quickly because their version of keto didn't work. And at the end of the day, we're all just pursuing what works for us. I almost hate yeah. putting a label on it. No, I agree. It's um, so actually for myself, I am now carnivore. I've been carnivore for a few months. Uh, I discovered over the past year, which they say you get keto adapted and eventually you're not burning as you don't have as many ketones measuring and stuff. I don't normally chase ketones, but because I do it therapeutically, I need to make sure it's at a certain dosage. So it wasn't reaching that point that I needed. I wasn't cheating. I was doing whole foods keto. Once in a while, I'd have the Lily's chocolate or something, but um, but that wasn't the cause. So I said, okay, I need to go deeper. I'm going carnivore. Gosh, my ketones went through the roof. I wish and I pray that we could do some kind of study with carnivore and epilepsy. So you guys know I've been doing 75 hard, right? One of the requirements for this is drink a gallon of water per day. I still find myself needing a little extra boost and a little bit more electrolytes to fuel all of these uh, workouts I've been doing. And that's why I'm super excited to be partnered with Element right now on the One Step Deeper podcast because I am needing all the electrolytes and they are providing life for me right now. They sent me this amazing package. Guys, look. What? We got watermelon. We got orange. We got raspberry. And my personal favorite is citrus because listen. It reminds me of margarita, and during 75 hard, you can't have those, so I'm telling you, this stuff is giving me life. So if you're interested in trying them for yourself and getting some great electrolytes, you can go to drinklmnt.com slash jimmy, and there you can get a free sample. All you have to do is pay the shipping. Hope you enjoy. Remember, just as Element says, stay salty. Well, I don't know about epilepsy, but Sean Baker is yeah. uh, has raised the funds to do some. And I'm sure as a subset within that study, he's going to have people with epilepsy and other conditions that they could monitor that way. So, But I wouldn't be surprised. So do you measure um, the, the glucose ketone index, GKI? I do. Yes, I have a little glucose monitor. I've used CGMs for a little bit, too. Um, and then I use Keto Coach. I have a Keto Mojo. Um, Keto Coach, for me, worked a little better price-wise as well. So I use theirs, um, and every morning fasting, and it's, that's how I'll do it. And the Keto Coach is more accurate than the Mojo. I do not like the Mojo's accuracy. No, I bought the Mojo like right before Keto Coach released theirs. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh, shoot. So then I, was, I did Mojo for a bit, and it wasn't as – I noticed – I don't think this is fitting right. I, I would measure um, the breath monitor sometimes too just to play around and see and compare. Um, but, yeah, the – Keto Coach is definitely super accurate. What's the uh, what's the ratio that you aim for with GKI? So for GKI, my my fasting glucose is still on the higher end. You know, it's it's under a hundred because of the insulin resistance. Yes, yes. So it's the insulin resistance score. I should preface first is it's a good score when I do the blood work, but I, I think I'm still very sensitive to it. And I've started working out and doing more muscle training to help that. What's your, but, A what's your A1C? Oh, 4.8 the whole time. Yeah, yeah there's no problem. Oh. My cholesterol, we're working on my small dents right now, um, trying to figure out what's causing an issue there. But my triglycerides are great. They're like 105. Um, my HDL is great. It's 88 last time I checked. So it's everything's really good. I haven't had any issues. Um, yeah inflammation score have you had any like hscrp or anything like that no i haven't done that one yet i want i actually have been seeing dr nally here in phoenix so i know it's been monitored really well i've heard of him yeah <laughs> i think you interviewed him once <laughs> uh yeah we used to do keto talk with jimmy moore in the doc yeah <laughs> yeah so he's helped me out with some stuff as well and um but yeah, the, the GKI, I, 
as a female, hormones always changing. So it depends where I am in my cycle, honestly. Um, right now, it's like my ketones are dropping down right before my, my new cycle begins. So I tend to fast more. I tend to aim uh, ketones like 1 to 1.5 is good for me. Um, the GKI, it just fluctuates really. Like 3 and below is ideal yeah. for the GKI. So no grand mal seizure since 2005. Congratulations, 16 Thank years. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any lingering still effects that you realize the epilepsy is still there? What, what are those things that you still kind of deal with eat despite doing everything? Good question. Um, one of them is something like this <laughs> when interviewing. And if there's um, stress, stress is a big one here and there where if I start feeling that, I can get, yeah, <laughs> deep breaths. <laughs> I can get a little woozy and stuff. Um, sun, I'm still very sensitive to the sun here and there. Uh, the medication causes that. So I'll get my vitamin D. I'll go outside for a little bit, but it's here in Phoenix. It's really hot, so I can't do it as much um, during the summertime. Although this summer has been great. We've had a huge monsoon season. The average weather in August has been 91 degrees, so it's been great. Um but yeah, I'd say the stress and the blood, not the blood pressure, the um, the nervousness and stuff, the anxieties, they're a little bit still, but nothing compared to before. Yeah, I was, I was telling people, 91 is very cold for Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> What's usually like 110, 115 there this time of year? This week, it's back up. It's And we have a huge mosquito surge. I have like 12 mosquito bites all over me. Uh, which is not very common but yeah it's, it's going back up it's like 110 this week now so you know you know there's kind of anecdotal evidence out there people put online that when they started getting higher ketones the bugs stopped biting them did you notice that at all or no well we normally don't have a lot of mosquitoes right. it's only because we've gotten so much rain so there's a lot of rain uh, like retention holders, people's backyards, you know, I mean, you, you're back east. So that's how it was when I was home in Boston. And um, yeah, so the, the water's sitting there, they're building the mosquitoes. But I mean, my ketones are 1.0 today. So I don't know. They bit me yesterday. Maybe they weren't as high yesterday. Maybe they're maybe tone loving uh, mosquitoes from that. <laughs> from that. Yeah, they're like, ooh, I love this uh, carnivore rich blood and ketone rich blood. <laughs> Yes, yes. So let's shift a little bit. Tell us about your coaching. What do you do? You help, help mostly women? Yeah, so my, my niche is with women. Um, I am being trained through Mark Sisson's program, Mark uh, Primal Health Institute, because like you said, I don't think everybody needs to be strict keto or strict carnivore. Um, I help my aunt who she is very metabolically healthy, and but we do have a history of Alzheimer's in our family. So she wants to be careful on that aspect. So I said, yeah, you can still have a higher carb, not higher carb standard diet, but like under 100. She's very athletic and everything. I'm like, you're good. So I guide her and let her know what kind of things to do. Um, just adding those healthy fats was all she needed. But I help other women, primarily insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, PCOS, um, and yeah, letting them know their carb tolerance and, and things like that. So I'm still working through the program with um, Primal Health, but uh, I'm helping some other people on the side in the meantime, because I'm self-educated through three years of stuff, so. Look, I think a coach like yourself is far more valuable than someone who just gets the education and has no experiential part to their story. Like part of what yeah. the arm of you is, you went through the rigmarole of all the medical everything with your epilepsy and you've come out the other side of it self-taught but now being formally taught i just i feel like people like yourself is who connects with people a lot more i, I love your link tree momin on keto ketone <laughs> momin on keto yes yes and i our whole family eats this way so i'll be car i'm carnivore currently my husband's like carnivore ish he still has his veggies here and there yep that's me <laughs> Um, I do have a four-year-old son that will be five in a couple weeks, um, and he is officially diagnosed on the spectrum. So we do incorporate some things with him. He is he happens to be allergic to wheat anyways, which I'm like, all right, that works out. We're not having it in the house anyways. Um, but he'll have his fruits. He doesn't like veggies. He loves his meats, his dairies. We'll throw some extra coconut oil, MCT, to help boost those ketones for him. 
I do take care of my mom who lives here. This is interesting, Jimmy. I don't know if you've heard this. So my mom has retinitis pigmentosa with her eyesight, which is tunnel vision. She also has glaucoma and then lost most of her eyesight. Wow. Since she moved here with us, she just eats the way we eat. Okay, good. Her eye pressure, when she got it checked shortly after, was the best it's ever been since diagnosed in 1995. Whoa. While eating ketogenic. And it's just, she was so excited. And three years still, she reversed her fatty liver, her fibromyalgia, lots of the stories you've heard plenty of times. But the eyesight was an interesting one for me. Yeah, and I've heard anecdotally other people talk about when they went keto, having progressively worse and worse and worse vision, different issues. And then they go keto, and then suddenly it goes the other direction. Like you had to get glasses for worse in the past, and now it's like you had yeah. to get glasses to go better again. Yeah. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. It, it's working too well. I have to go the other direction to buy glasses. No, exactly. So, yeah, it's been a blessing for her, too. She's still, unfortunately, the sight is completely gone out of one eye, but the other she still has a little bit. So keeping that pressure in a good range. So, Jen, how do we communicate with the world more about nutrition and its powerful effects? Because you've seen it yourself in, in your epilepsy control. Uh, you said your husband overcame colitis in five weeks. You've got a kid that's autistic and you're feeding ketogenic, trying to get the key ketones in there. You've got the <laughs> moms have the eyesight. Like it seems like it's so powerful and your family is just the spitting image epitome of what could happen to society if we embrace this more. What do you think we could do besides what I'm doing out here blah, 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 all the time, <laughs> writing books and doing all I can to do my part? It's like, yes. what more can we do? You know, that's, that's a hard one. I feel like just being a witness and people seeing the stories, making the stories, like I'm, I'm privileged to be on your story to help or your program to help share the story. Um, I feel like non-pressuring is a big thing. Some people feel pressured, meeting people where they're at. You know, some people, the way that I work with people is a step-by-step -step thing. So I don't say, okay, you have to jump in all at once. I'm like, okay. Let's figure out the first thing you can get rid of, vegetable oils. First thing, that might be too hard. Okay, let's get rid of sugar first and a step-by-step -step thing. Letting people know that there is a way to do it um, and just, yeah, seeing all the, the evidence. And now <laughs> with uh, all the hokey pokey stuff and all that stuff going on, FDA approving it, and we're starting to see more and more certain things in the medical field that – it's harder to trust, so it's easier to trust people like um, their stories, what's going on. But we are all unique. We're all diverse. Yeah. So that's why I say meeting people where they're at, just educating. Well, and what's funny is people are like, how can you be so skeptical of the science? I'm like, I've been skeptical of the science for 17 years. Yeah. I got in this gig. It was like FDA is lying to us about the health and USDA dietary guidelines is bunk. And so it's like, everybody, how can you be so skeptical? I'm like, how could I not be with what I've seen? Uh, and now what we're seeing now is just kind of speeding up that process of people going, huh, like, what do we do with this now? So it, it is fascinating. And you're right. I do think what has transpired over the past couple of years is making people think twice now about, hmm, maybe I should take this nutrition thing a little more seriously. Yeah, and well, it's just ancestral. When you keep learning about the ancestral aspect about all this, it's like our ancestors weren't eating Pop-Tarts, weren't eating cereal for breakfast. They weren't eating all that. It was the meat and the fat and once in a while some berries that the fruit doesn't even look the same anymore. You know, it's like it, it's learning history of nutrition, really. And, th and that's what's fully convinced me. That's why I know on carnivore I'll be fine. You know, it's so why aren't we teaching that in the schools, by the way, where there's history of nutrition? Here's what an apple used to look like. Here's what a watermelon used to look like. Here's how they went and hunt, hunted for the foods and they ate the whole part of the animal. And here's all the parts of the yeah. animal. How amazing would that be if they're teaching that in school? But no, I remember when I was a kid in the 80s, we had to memorize the food pyramid. We had to like, how many greens a day did you need? Uh, uh, uh. And it's like yeah. none of that gets taught, none of the good 
history of nutrition ever gets taught, how cool would it be if we could turn that around? Oh, that would be that would be amazing. It would. The problem is though, Jimmy. Then the pharmaceutical industry is screwed, as well as the medical industry. Well, so God forbid we teach real nutrition. Well, well, and there it is: big food, big pharma. There's just too many special interests at play, and this is part of when I talk to people, trying to educate them outside of the podcast world. Uh, of look, do you realize there's special interests that want to keep you sick, that want to keep yeah. you fat? And they keep selling you foods that make you fat and sick so they can sell you drugs that make you somewhat better, but not all the way better. But then you go on a diet and they sell you those things with the big food. But then the same companies that make the junk food make the diet food. And it's like this all over the place. Kind of tie it all together for people. They go, holy crap. Mm -hmm. No, exactly. Exactly. It's, I mean, and I'll admit the first two years, my husband and I, there would be many times where we would think, are we doing something wrong? Are we going to get a heart attack? You know, what's going to happen? But we just kept feeling better. And it's that's the thing people need to learn is my keto is different from Jimmy's keto. Like my husband's keto is different from mine. My son's, my everybody's is different. It's, it's part of the biohacking and figuring out what works for you and what doesn't. And that's what I do with the coaching is we meet up together uh, virtually most of the time because you know, it's easier nowadays. And just talking them through, okay, how did you feel? How did, um, how has this week been working for you? How did you feel after eating this food? Um, even bringing in, I love what you're doing now with the mental health, Jimmy, because it, it really is a factor. Like for me, I wanted to lose weight also to be healthy, but I have had similar childhood traumatic uh, situations such as yours and learning, sorry, my dog, um, and figuring that part out of what role does that play in the health yes. of the weight plateau, of the cortisol spikes and all that stuff. So that is a part that I'm working on as well now. I've, I've resolved most of it, but you know, it's, it's peeling an onion. There's layers. And so, yeah. And the more you peel, the more you find. And you're just like, oh, another one? Uh, what? I know. <laughs> I know. It's, it's a struggle. But like, um, but it's good. I think in the name of the game, though, is just staying in the game. Um, and I'm about to embark on this journey where I'm going 100 days in a row of doing all kinds of really interesting biohacks. I'll be sharing more soon. But it's just, it's incredible how many people give up because they feel like they've done everything. They feel like they're not getting any good positive feedback for the things that they have done. And so therefore they're like, well, I'm not gonna get any credit for what I have tried to do. Why should I try it all? So encourage that person that thinks that way. How do you talk to clients like that? That's a good question. I actually just had a client recently that that's what happened. Um, I think the bottom line is pretty much a lot of times there's an unhealthy attachment and we have to get to the behavior aspect and the addiction aspect. What what are you feeling when you want to go for that bread? You know, to because she really wants that bread right now. What are you feeling? Um, what's driving you? Is it true hunger? Or is it, I feel peer pressure because I'm at a party? Or is it just, uh, yeah, just to evaluate those emotions yeah. when that temptation's coming? That's pretty much the root of, I'd say, 90% of people. Are you tired of playing the mask game? Me too. That's why I wanted to tell you about the unmask. This is a breathable, completely breathable. It covers, you can't even see that it's breathable, but it's breathable. Whether you're going on a plane, having to go into a store and wearing this thing, playthemaskgame.com is how you can get this mask. They come in all kinds of colors and everything. In fact, right there, you can see right through it what it is, but when you're wearing it, it does not look like it's anything different, but... <sighs> It's breathable, baby. Playthemassgame.com. Look, I can admit from firsthand experience, like when you have done lots of things to put yourself in a good position and things aren't moving, weight, health markers, whatever you're measuring, there is a frustration level that comes in right here that it's hard to suck yourself out of those things that you think have failed. Now, maybe there's things you need to tweak and move, but maybe not. Maybe what you're doing is the right thing. It's just taking more time for the body to heal. So getting people to reconcile that there is a timeline 
and they're and it's not linear to anything <laughs> like for right. people there's so much damage done it could take years for them to get to the point that they're wanting in their head and or you may not ever get to that idealization of what you're thinking in your head as well and how do you convince those people of what you're doing is saving your life because but for what you're doing you would probably be dead exactly right actually my husband talks about that like he was a big salty snack chip eater the um the chocolate bars milky ways all that stuff and we we joke but not joke like he was probably really close to getting a heart attack at some point you know if he didn't switch this way it's who knows what his blood markers were before he didn't really go to the doctor much except for the colitis so, I mean, his markers are great now as well. And we just say, like, what if we didn't change? Where would I be at? Would I have ended up having a seizure driving? Yeah. Um, you know, what would the medication have caused my liver to be completely screwed up? You know, it's, yeah, it's, I, I, there are, the hard part for me is when there's people I know that will benefit from this, yeah. but they just, they're just too stuck in their ways or they're scared or whatever. And um, we just have to wait till they're ready. You can lead a horse to water. You can't make them drink. Well, and a lot of them are very trusting in what their doctor say. And if it doesn't say it, then they just don't believe it. And, you know, I'm even hearkening to my own brother, Kevin, which yesterday w would have been his birthday. It would have been his mm -hmm. fourth birthday. He died in 2008 at the age of 41 from heart disease, morbid obesity, diabetes, all the rest. And I, I, I just... I think about him often that he's kind of that epitome of he tried things and they would work and then he would feel better he off because he felt better and he wanted to go back to normal again, which as you stated earlier, there is no normal. The normal is the lifestyle you chose. Keep doing it. Yeah. But I feel like he's more indicative of the average person than not that if they're going to try something, they'll do it for a period of time, but they don't want to, put in the commitment what do you think people what do you think makes people reticent to making that commitment yeah i think it can be a number of things i think a lot of people they don't realize the sugar addiction they have i, I think that's a, a big one the emotional eating um just and and like you said the trust of their doctors you know it's it, they roll this relationship and i i should make sure people understand i'm not bashing all doctors there are some fantastic doctors there um, but they are the minority, unfortunately, yeah. uh, to incorporate nutrition. So I, I think from my experience, that's usually the, the top ones. It's, I do have some friends that they they admit full out. I know I have a sugar addiction. I know I, I, yeah, you know, it's, it's hard for me to get rid of. And I'm like, all right, you acknowledged it. That's good. <laughs> that's the well, key. And, and they'll acknowledge the addiction, but not even realizing what they're saying by saying that. When you say, I'm addicted to, it means you can't give it up without help. And so yeah. that is eat more fat, cut the sugar and eat more fat. That's your help. The help right. is hire a coach like Coach Jen to be able to you know, walk you through those times when you don't really know what to choose. Help is also uh, replacing this thing that you think you can't live without. For me, it was macaroni and cheese back in the day with something new that now fulfills that same dopamine need in the brain. Like we're not, we're not seeking sugar, we're seeking dopamine. And yes. if we realize that we could replace one dopamine hit for another dopamine hit, we could probably fix a lot of these issues. No, exactly. Yeah, you, I, I agree 100%. It's, the other thing is, what, what is, what is the point of food? The point of food is to nourish so we have energy, so we can go with our day, so we can think. If we're saying we are addicted to X, Y, Z, then, or sugar or bread or whatever, the food now has control over us, yes. and it's no longer for nourishment, the whole sole purpose of it. Yes. Um, I heard, I can't remember his name at the moment, but the carb addiction doctor, he was talking about how sugar is, oh, okay, go ahead. Dr. Robert Sywis is his name. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, he was talking about how sugar is addicting. It's hard to give up, but protein and fat, you, you don't get addicted to it. You're not like, oh my gosh, I need to get some meat. It's, you know, there, no, it's just, I'm although, hungry. Although I will tell you when I go to Texas and I get 
Texas brisket barbecue. I'm addicted to Texas <laughs> barbecue. <laughs> Yes, we love our brisket. There is also certain bacons where it, and pork belly sometimes are hard for me to stop. But it's it's still different. And as far as like the dopamine hit that you talk about, it's yes. it's a very different craving. Yeah, get. yeah. Uh, but you're not craving it to the point that you could just keep eating and eating and eating and eating and eating and never stop. Whereas with sugar, right. sugar and carb, refined carbohydrates, you definitely can. That's why they're very palatable foods because they know you can't stop eating them once you, you and you keep eating like that's the thing yeah. i never thought about this i used to eat like boxes of little debbie snack cakes at a time boxes after boxes and i would never stop yeah. the leptin's not being like the leptin is uh it, it's not hitting that aspect like you're not getting that full sensation and um yeah, I, I was, my weakness were cookies all the time, cookies and chips. And even post, so I, after I had my son, um, and I was, I, I was about 220 at that point, 20 pounds, I would have the Kashi granola bars thinking I was being healthy. <laughs> Little did I know what that was doing. And the soy protein isolate that totally screwed my cycle. It took two years for my cycle to return back to normal with all the so soy protein isolate I was having. Oh, um, soy in general, yeah. All of the things we ate in the name of health, I did fig Newtons for that purpose. <laughs> oh, it's fig. We, we had those too, yeah. That'd be better for you, and it was better, I suppose, than an Oreo, but marginally, you know. And the Oreo, though, and yeah. The, and the Boca burgers, before they had all the Beyond Meat possible, they had Boca burgers. Yes of those thinking it was better yeah Mackwells, we could go down the list of all the things that fooled us in granola bars nutrigrain uh or what was the uh, sun chips those those sun chips. chips yes and the baked the baked versions of the chips then yeah yeah it's yeah it's, it's incredible the way the food manufacturers fooled us into thinking we were eating healthy and I suppose marginally so compared to what we were eating, but still not great. And, and again, all depending on what the root, like what your issue is. If you're insulin resistant, diabetic, that's not making any difference. You know, it's, it's still, it's still feeding the problem. So, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a problem that's going to be there, but it's like, it's what keeps me up every day doing what I do, Jen, because I, I feel like, I feel like we're at that turning point where people want to make a change, but they've heard the vilification of things like keto and carnivore and meat and, oh, I'm not so sure. But then they get reassurance hearing stories like yours here today. So I guess we just need to keep chirping and keep telling people how it is and uh, yeah. catch on. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I love sharing different people. Uh, like one of my upcoming goals is to start making more infographics like a lot of yeah, uh, the other people do. Um, I'm just focusing more on finishing the class first, <laughs> but I, I love sharing the ones I agree with. Um, and and yeah, that it's not it's not just about the net carbs or you know the it's just all the stuff out there that's floating in the information and and the fact that now the food industry is picking up on keto with all the net carb stuff and what. Right. It's just giving you all these horrible fibers that you don't need. And well, a lot of people don't get that yet still. Well, and, and they recognize it because they count any fiber as net carb. So that like fiber in whole grains, oh, you can subtract that. No, 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 no you can't. But no. um, they certainly try, don't they? So Yeah, they do. And I, I fell for it in the beginning. You know, I was like, oh, look at this amazing keto ice cream. And then but you're still hungry. And for me, it hits that, that dopamine that you're saying here, and I'm not getting the calories that my body's thinking it's getting. So then I want more and I want more. And that's when I was like, gosh, I gotta, I gotta change something, you know, and, and that's part of this carnivore journey now too, is, is kind of resetting my gut balance and the insulin resistance and all that. And I, I feel fantastic on it. I, I don't know if I'll ever leave it. <laughs> yeah. I've been, Keto carnivore for about three and a half years now, and it, it has been a game changer. I'm not anal retentive about it. If I want some almonds, I'll have some almonds, avocado, sure. but the vast majority of my diet is meat based and I and animal based foods. So I I love it. I love it.
Yeah. Well, guys, go check out Coach Jen Winkler over on Instagram. And uh, she's got a link tree there. And once you're there, you can uh, see all the things that she talks about. Uh, she's got the recipe for protein sparing modified bread. Why yes. the jabby jab in the in the for the hokey pokey <laughs> for the black plague. You got all kind of stuff on here. Keto avocado fudge brownies. Oh, I'm gonna click. Yes. Oh, you I'm have to try those. <laughs> okay, so you do videos over on YouTube as well. I, I pressed it and went to a video. I went, oh, we don't want to play the video. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually, my website's still getting developed. So right now it's just reach out to me on Instagram. Um, we're getting all that still developed. And Jeffrey says, we love you, Jimbo. Thanks for all the good info you provided. Thank you uh, for watching and being a faithful husband to this beautiful lady right here. Jen, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks so much, Jim. I really appreciate it. And keep doing what you're doing. It's great. Real Good Foods is one of the fastest growing frozen food companies in the U.S. Everything they make is nutrient dense, high in protein, low in carbs, and made from real food ingredients. Instead of using processed flours, everything they make is 100% grain-free and gluten-free, which is how they keep their carbs so low. They can be found at Costco, Walmart, Target, Kroger, and in almost every grocery store nationwide. Or you can order online. Check us out today at realgoodfoods.com and at realgoodfoods on social media.